Let's compare audio on a Teensy using the audio shield to get audio in and out of the Teensy, comparing that to using an analog input to bring in audio, and sending audio out through a built-in DAC or a dual PWM DAC circuit. Up till now, when I've done Teensy audio experiments, since I have this 16-bit I2S audio shield, I've been using this for line in and out audio and processing it inside the Teensy. And this is the most basic sketch that uses this. This would be essentially an audio pass-through where we would take audio line in, bring it into the Teensy environment, but send it straight out without processing to the line out on that same audio shield. And then this object right here just allows us to control the chip on the audio shield. Let's put a sine wave in and see how it looks coming back out. Using the Teensy audio board with line in for the top trace and line out at the bottom. With the input signal turned off, we have a quiet output. 100 hertz, 1 volt peak to peak in, and maybe a little less out. Zooming in on it, looks good. 1 kilohertz. Also looks good. 10 kilohertz. Looks good. And 20 kilohertz. It's got some weird amplitude modulation looking thing happening, but generally okay. There's 15 kilohertz, which many people may not even be able to hear, but looks good and steady there. But if we don't have such a board and we don't want the expense of it, we can get audio into the Teensy using the standard analog to digital converter. So over in this audio design tool GUI, when you click on the ADC, there's information over on the side. So I dragged this ADC from the input options here to get my audio in. And it shows that we would use Teensy pin 16, which is analog A2. And looking at the Teensy 3.6 pinouts, this is pin 16, analog A2, and that's where we would connect this recommended circuit. This little biasing and filtering circuit will AC couple the audio in and then re-bias it at 0.6 volts with this voltage divider between 3.3 volts and analog ground. The analog input can have a voltage between 0 and 1.2 volts. With this voltage divider giving us 0.6 volts, that's halfway to 1.2 volts. So now any audio can swing plus 0.6 to minus 0.6, and that's our signal range. And this is the circuit I put together. I didn't draw myself a new schematic because it's straightforward enough looking at this reference. We take our audio in, whether it's a signal generator or an MP3 player, the signal would come here and I connected the ground to this analog ground. So once I had this all set up, I wanted to try the regular built-in DAC and the PWM DAC simultaneously. Looking at the info for using the regular DAC, you just take this DAC and you can bring that to an amplifier. And if you need AC coupling, as usual, you can just add a series capacitor. So there's this one output pin, and on the Teensy 3.6, I'm pretty sure it was DAC 0, so from there, I'm taking that DAC output through a series 10 microfarad, where the positive terminal is connected to the Teensy DAC pin, and the negative terminal comes to this LM386 speaker amplifier. My circuit is pretty much this, except I only put 100 micro on this output, and I don't have this 0.05 and 10 ohm. So that's how our schematic is shaping up. We have this block here. Audio's coming in right here. This is connected to Teensy. Then I have the LM386, and I'm plugging it into the DAC pin or jumping it over to the PWM circuit. With the input signal generator turned off, channel 2 is on the DAC output, which is a series 10 micro in line with the C DAC output and then straight to the scope probe. When I turn on 100 hertz sine wave at 1 volt peak to peak, pretty much the same voltage in and out and 100 hertz, not really any noise. There's just phase shift for the delay going into digital and back out to analog. And when I zoom in, it still looks like a smooth output sine wave. At 1 kilohertz, it still looks generally good. When I zoom in, 
now I can start to see that digitizing staircase for the samples. At 5 kilohertz, it's starting to look like it belongs on the cover of an old 8-bit video game or something. 10 kilohertz and 20 kilohertz, the PWM circuit. They're using a dual PWM architecture and they have this recommended circuit. So I also built this. And these two pins are the same position on the Teensy 3.6. So when I want to bring the 386 amplifier over to here, I just take the V in from this volume potentiometer and I go straight to here because this already has a 10 micro AC coupling capacitor. So again, the schematic is pretty much drawn right here. We just have to connect up to the amplifier. So I didn't really feel a need to redraw all this. As for how this dual PWM works, I went all over the place looking for information. So I found some theory, some calculations, but I still can't wrap my head around it. So I'm just going to link to a bunch of these articles below. This one here started coming close to getting me to understand, but basically we're taking a certain number of bits and instead of sending them all out on the one PWM channel, we're splitting them up and sending them out on two different channels and then recombining them as an analog voltage with two different resistor values of a certain ratio. And I'm not a mathematologist, so just trying to look at it more intuitively, if we have eight bits and we want them to be all ones, which equals decimal 255, we could send all those eight bits out on one PWM line, or if we split it up into two different lines where we send 1111 on each, the PWM output that's sending the four higher order bits, if they're all one, it really represents a decimal 240, and it's the majority of the output final signal. And the other PWM output that also has all ones, but it only represents the lower order bits, it represents only decimal 15. So when you add 15 to 240, you end up with the original 255. So because the lower order bits represent only a small fraction of the overall signal, that's why the two resistors have different values so that one of the PWM outputs is scaled down a lot more than the other. And when you recombine the analog signal, you're recombining those two different sets of bits. Here's how the sine wave looks coming into the ADC input and being reconstructed by the dual PWM circuit. We're just probing the output of the PWM circuit. There's no other amplifier stage or anything else connected. The top scope trace is the input, which is connected to a signal generator that's currently turned off. The output channel 2 is at the PWM circuitry output. So we have nothing going in and we have about 1.8 volts peak to peak of this waveform coming out. And if we zoom in on the waveform, it looks like this is our 88 kilohertz PWM carrier frequency. If I turn on the sine wave input at 100 hertz and one volt peak to peak, we get our output sine wave, but with this extra noise riding on it, one kilohertz in and looks like one kilohertz with noise out. 10 kilohertz in, 10 kilohertz with noise out. And when we start going beyond 10 kilohertz, we start going toward a noisy flat line. This is 13 kilohertz. And there's 20 kilohertz and just noise. Let's see how the actual music would sound on the PWM, the DAC, and the I squared S audio board.
Overall, maybe we could improve the DAC and PWM DAC with better filtering, maybe op amp circuits. But from a practical standpoint, if all we have is a couple of resistors and capacitors, we can still do a reasonable job working with audio circuits without having to have the specialized audio shield. But if we want higher quality audio across the full audio range, the audio shield would be useful. If you found this useful or interesting, give it a thumbs up. If you think somebody might find this information useful, feel free to share. See you on the next video.